Uh, next we have uh, Sarah Novotny. Novotny, yes. Um, who is the uh, VP of MySQL and LAMP practice at Blue Gecko. She's a founder of uh, Blue Gecko uh, and is additionally the program chair of OzCon and the chair of AOUG's MySQL uh, council. Mm -hmm. Sarah is talking to us about uh, where is your data cached and where should it be cached. Hi. So I actually conceived of this talk uh, at one point when I was having a problem because I had a monitor that was telling me that everything was all right and a customer that was telling me things weren't. And I realized over the course of this particular problem that there are a lot of places that data is cached in the modern web stack. And so I sat and I thought about it for a while and it, it led me to this talk ultimately because I was really curious as to how many places I could find and I'm still sure I missed many. But, whoops, let's see if I can do that better. There we go. So why are we actually functionally caching? It's one of the things I'm gonna start with. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm gonna go through the different places that I found. And then, of course, what's redundant, what's not, what's risky, what's not, and where ultimately and how you can do benchmarking and monitoring. Um, pretty broadly, I'm not gonna dig in very deeply to any specific tools, but uh, giving you guys some ideas of the different things that I ran into as I was working on this particular problem. Interesting. Why do I keep blanking? There we go. Okay, I think I have the plan. So ultimately caching is to try and make things faster for your end user experience. It's pretty straightforward. We want to be moving data as close as possible to the end user while still maintaining consistency, integrity, being able to update things, all while making everything go fast. So. Fast, of course, is what our world is about these days. No one, no one wants a slow web page. I think the abandonment rate after seven seconds is just absurd. So if you're at you know, a second and a half, two seconds, you're good, starts to really exponentially change after that. So making things as fast as we can is what we spend most of our time doing, ideally. Break fixes would be the worst part. So I started counting the different caching layers and I started very much based with the hardware. You've got your CPU caches. Um, you've got data that is written to these caches instead of to memory because it's faster. You have different levels of CPU caching, of course, because you have different sizes of registers or different sizes of caches because the larger the cache, the longer it takes to scan. So I then found disk caches. So the actual physical hardware of a disk has caching on it as well, which is fantastic, um, except that you expect when you tell a disk to write something that it actually writes it. Not really how it works. Then you've got disk controller caches if you have more than one disk. Um, and then you can also have disk controller caches and disk caches not playing nicely. So I'm up to three levels here. If, have I missed anything in that middle space? Anybody want to throw another one in there? Yeah? Hard drives might have uh, RAM on them. Oh, yes, the modern hard drives start to have actual RAM on them. Yeah, I mean, you just it's crazy the number of places we stash data at this point. Anybody else? Did I miss others? Yeah? The uh, SSD, drive, SSD hybrid drives. Mm-hmm. SSD hybrid drives, another spot. Um, we then go up toward, up toward operating system caches. So you've got your file system caches. And again, another spot that you're not necessarily having a lot of transparency as to what you're finding, uh, what you're finding in those uh, file system caches. Database caches. My world, as uh, the intro said, has been a lot about databases over the last 10 years. So I'm gonna kind of sit in the middle here in a minute. But um, you also, people have added, after you've got your file system, operating system, database caches, then we have sort of a memcached layer because people want things to go faster. Um, Non-persistent, much like memory, much like the uh, CPU caches, the disk caches. Um, 
We have application code caches, and specifically, uh, you have ca you, people who are writing applications can write caches into their applications. In this case, I was actually thinking more like uh, PHP precompilers. And you can have HTTP caching, so the reverse proxy varnish sort of caching. And that, of course, is always trying to get content as fast as you can out to the end user. And lastly, I came up with edge or CDN caching for things like images. So other ideas that I've missed? Did I miss a pile more? Yep. Uh, we have uh, Prince, uh, you have provider and the customer's caches that are transparent. You have uh, browser caches and you have browser disk caches and browser RAM caches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the way to the end customer, and then we have more. So. It turns out, I counted up nine, plus you guys added two or three more on the server side, and then I counted up another six or so on the client side. All of this not transparent to you, not easy for you to dig into. Um, not all of it, some of it you can dig into. Ultimately, I found out that it's a whole lot harder to know what your end customer is seeing than I ever hoped it would be, especially because the people that I know that are looking at my website, that are testing things for me actually with wetware, have the skills, have the knowledge to be able to, say, flush their browser cache or you know, flush their DNS cache locally or know that when something hasn't updated, it's because their ISP hasn't propagated a DNS change. So ultimately, I came up with something like, uh, 17 or 18 different spots of caching. You guys added a couple more. We've got a lot of spots where data just kind of sits and hangs out. Some of it's transient, some of it's um, actually durable. And my world, as I said here, is uh, as a DBA. So I want to know where your data is. I want to know that your data is consistent. I want to know that your data is durable. I want to know that your data is actually solid and repeatable. And I think I just hit half of acid, but anyway. My world has also been MySQL. I can't talk to you guys about Oracle. This is the wrong conference. MySQL, I swear. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be using MySQL uh, terminology when I start talking about some of the database caches. I think it's more, uh, more approachable, and I don't know anything about Postgres. So it seems like we'll work that way. So my focus for this is going to be approximately uh, the middle part, because this is the database world. I'm not going to worry about the end client space. You really can't control that. Uh, the edge caches and the HTTP caches, a little bit different. Um, I'm interested in the meat in the middle, you know, what's between the buns, so to speak. Thank you. That was, in fact, a joke. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, we have to follow our policies. <clears throat> so some of these caches actually turn out to be redundant and sort of, sometimes, it depends. This is one of the problems with them. Um, so you end up with twins that do something very similar, but they don't always behave exactly the same way. So for example, um, the disk caching and disk controller caching can handle the same sort, of, uh, same sort of function, except that you really, really don't want to have your database thinking it's written its data out to a disk and find out that it's actually in a disk cache. Because if you have an um, unintended power event, you will lose the data that the database thinks has been written out of its caches down to the disk, but it's not there. So um, making sure, that, of course, with databases that your disk controller, if you have a, uh, if you have your disk caches, if you have a battery backed up disk controller cache, have to be shut off. So those two tend to be a little bit redundant. Um, you want to be sure that when you have databases specifically, you are writing all the way out to the disk or that you have a way that your changes will be durable through a, through a power event. So in the case of MySQL, you have the inner DB buffers as part of the caches. You have, um, you have uh, the query cache. Then you would have, say, a RAID controller cache. And then you would have, I hope, turned off your disk controller caches. Because this means that the database, when it thinks it's written it out, has at least written it out to the battery backed up controller cache so that that change is durable, unless, of course, your battery has died. But 
we won't go into that sort of a failure case. So why do we keep doing this? Why do we move this data around? Why do we obfuscate all of this? We want things to go faster. But you've got this, you've also got this uh, conflict between the file system caching and the database caching. So your database buffer pool and your database query cache uh, will be also double buffered with a, a file system cache if you have the file system tuned to cache. So you want your database to be writing out directly if you can and not buffering into the file system. Um, file system caches are not particularly dangerous with modern file systems because they are usually journaled, but they are definitely some place that you can have data stuck that slows things down. So you don't want to be buffering and buffering and buffering. You want to be getting things retrieved as fast as you possibly can and written as fast as you possibly can. Oh, and I did that black thing again. There we go. So which of these caches are big risks? I talked a little bit about um, the disk controller cache. What other caches are risky for databases, for web applications, if you're not using them properly? Come on, somebody, okay, back there. Yep, you can get, so, so he said that, yeah, your system data, you, you can get, if your expiries aren't set well with something like the memcached layer, you can have things um, not behave properly. Memcached is an interesting one because I tend to think of memcached as most useful for transient data, for session data, for something that you wouldn't necessarily uh, be able to Retrie or you wouldn't need to retrieve or it would not be catastrophic if you lost it. So that's where I tend to use memcached most often. Hmm? Uh, disk caches on hypervisors. A lot of hypervisors have underlying disk caches now. Yeah. And the caching rights can be very... So he, he suggested that the disk caches within hypervisor layers. I didn't even dig into the virtualization layer on this. That would have made my mind melt, I think. Um, between that and the heat. So I, I didn't dig further into that specifically, but you're right, when, when you, have, um, you have your uh, hypervisor layer, again, it's answering that it has written things out and it just hasn't. It's got things in memory, it's got things in cache. So what we really don't want to be doing here is playing three card Monty with your data. Um, so disks lie, disks lie all the time. They tell you that they've written out data, you're, you're seeing fantastic write speeds to your disks, you're all excited, and it turns out that you're not really writing that fast, or you're not actually getting the data down to the disk. And that's, that's a real problem. Um, we have in here uh, rate controllers. They also lie sometimes. Um, but they lie a little bit better, if you can lie better. Um, they lie in a way that actually, if you've gone ahead and spent that extra $100, has a battery backup so that in the event of a power failure, you can retrieve that data. That data will be written out by the database or by the disk controller, and then the database will have it to retrieve as it's appropriate. Um, so the combination of disk and disk controller is one that can get kind of sticky because if you think that you're not caching on your disk and your disk controller thinks it is caching and those don't happen to be pro correctly set, then you end, up with, uh, you end up not knowing where your data is and not knowing where you are going to actually have uh, the data durability, whether or not you have that data durability. And it's something that I have seen far, far too many sysadmins and DBAs get bitten by. It's something that I always test. There's really very little you can do that is better than having a catastrophic failure, or power failure event on purpose. It's good to test it. It's good to know what you've got. It's good to know how it's working. So the combination of disk and disk controller is an interesting one and you have to make sure that your disk controller is doing the caching, has a battery backup, your disk is not doing the caching, and is just actually writing directly. So you can have, uh, you can have challenges with all of these different caching layers in performance too. 
So understanding MySQL specifically wants to go ahead and bypass or, or behaves better if it goes ahead and bypasses the file system cache, except in a couple of cases. Uh, does anybody know those cases where it doesn't behave better? No? Hooray, I can tell you something new. Um, so if it's a local disk, Bypassing the file system cache is better. And by local, I include a RAID controller. If it is not actually a locally attached disk, it's a SAN or something like that, then you will see a horrible, horrible um, change in your, your data write speeds by using a method like odirect instead of um, the, the standard syncs. So you want to uh, understand your architecture and make sure that you know what you have and then that leads us to benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. It's not really that you shouldn't do this at home, you should all do this at home. You should benchmark, you should understand what your, uh, what your needs are, what your customer needs are, and what you can do with your hardware. So I really, I have to say benchmarking is one of those things that no one can really do enough. And I'm sure that there are some um, academic sysadmins out there who spend more time benchmarking than they need to, but I think that they are the exception as opposed to the rule. Um, benchmarking really isn't magic. It is determining what you need to know, where your customer will see it, and then also being able to determine whether or not you're reading from the shorthand version. So it's not very exciting to do a benchmark that exercises your file system cache. It just it doesn't give you any good data. So there's no value in it in that case. So you need to be making sure that you are touching the slow points to know what your slowest times are within benchmarking. So sometimes that means doing benchmarks that are outside of how it actually looks within production. And then I'm going to go on in a moment and contradict myself. So, so something where you might turn off a file system cache to make sure that you're hitting the disk every time, or you might turn off a RAID controller cache to make sure you're hitting the disk every time to see your slowest case. Um, or bypassing memcached, uh, or bypassing um, an edge cache if you want to look end to end as opposed to just with database work. Um, but here's where I contradict myself. But you want to be testing in exactly the case that you are going to be running. So this, for me, usually means hardware. This doesn't mean uh, making sure that I'm running through all the caches. It also means making sure that you're running and testing and benchmarking with a live data set as well as a, an actual workload. So again, with this, if you benchmark you know, exercising your database caches or your file system caches, it, it isn't useful, it isn't helpful. So making sure that you are having captured an actual data set and having captured an actual workload and then working with those in order to make sure that you are exercising what really happens in production. And ideally, you'll be doing it on staging hardware that looks very much like production. Now, I say very much. Um, I know a lot of companies, startups, uh, small businesses can't afford, choose not to afford identical staging hardware. Um, in that case, I will often try to find a very low time for these customers in order to do some benchmarking against their actual production databases. Um, that doesn't always go as planned, as, as you might guess. Um, sometimes you, you know, blow out the entire cache in a database and slow everything down for the customers that might actually be there at 2 a.m. Um, sometimes it means that, uh, that you end up uh, knocking over entirely a production infrastructure if you've benchmark it, benchmarked it really hard. And that then takes things offline. So it's not, it's kind of a, a benchmark of last resort. If you can have the staging hardware or the um, dev hardware that is similar, then I always recommend using that as well. As far as benchmarking with actual data, it's a great way to exercise your backups because you, there's no such thing as a valid backup. There are only valid restores. So we should restore as often as we can to test this. Um, so I love pulling backups and testing that for my benchmarks, using that to, to rebuild a staging environment because your staging environment might have uh, an older data set. I also then capture a workload 
directly either through TCP dump if my uh, databases haven't been haven't had the traffic in between them encrypted. I can capture the actual workload with the TCP dump. There are a couple of other tools in MySQL that allow you to capture the actual workload as well and be able to replay that against your staging database and your functionally production data that is on your staging database. So every infrastructure has its idiosyncrasies. What your next door neighbor is doing to benchmark his system is probably not going to look the same as what you're going to need to do to benchmark yours. But understanding those differences and trying to tease out where your slow points are, understanding how slow they are, and then being able to have the, the slow case of a benchmark and then the best case of a benchmark is really, really important. So. Oh, hey, this is my staging hardware. There you go, staging hardware. Um, I also sometimes suggest that people, if you don't have a staging instance um, and you have uh, the ability at late, late nights to potentially break a replica and do the benchmarking against the replica and then bring it back together, it again is an exercise, not in that case of uh, a restore, but it's an exercise of the practice of repairing a replica or bringing back online a replica that's behind. So it's, a, it's another good way to uh, potentially benchmark. <clears throat> and as far as monitoring goes, this, as I said in the beginning, this talk began because a customer was seeing something that I couldn't reproduce and I needed to understand where this, where this had broken down. So monitoring is something that you want, of course, you all know this, you've been sysadmins for years. You want to have monitors for the cases where you can actually, um, the cases that you actually want to, ex the positive cases you want to exist. But that's not as simple as checking for uh, a positive return code on HTTP, because there are so many other things that can break uh, before that. So you want before or between that and still return a 200. So you want to be testing at multiple layers within your infrastructure, doing monitoring within multiple layers of your infrastructure, and making sure that you are testing um, not only what the end customer sees, but potentially application work that goes all the way through touching down to the database, as well as doing direct monitoring of the database. So there's, there's a lot to be written uh, in monitors and a lot to be managed and uh, I tend to think of monitoring as something that is just ever evolving because you find a new failure case, you, find, you write a new monitor. This is the same as uh, software development and test cases. I found a new failure case, I write a new monitor. I find a new failure case, I write a new test. Because ultimately, you want to be measuring everything that could possibly give you a fire drill. And that's really hard to do, especially when you've got that you know, full stack of caching that I described. Um, You've got to be understanding all the different touch points, all the different intersection points, all the different integration points that this very complex architecture has. Um, every architecture is different. That was my snowflake earlier. So what, you know, when you go to the local sysadmins group and talk to somebody about what they actually do for monitoring, theirs is going to look different from yours. And theirs is going to look, um, and you will be able to evolve yours from what theirs might have started as. Uh, and it's always good to have those conversations. But know that it will be a little bit different and that you want to be monitoring everything you possibly can to avoid a fire drill. Um, you functionally want to be the one that is knowing that there's something broken well before our customer either does that or calls you and says that that's happening. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity and tools within the monitoring that, uh, that you can use. MySQL specific I'm talking about here. Um, well, not entirely. Nagios and Cacti templates are great. Um, Sysbench is a tool that was written by MySQL AB long before Sun and Oracle acquired them. And it's a really, really useful tool for replaying actual work logs against your database. Um, another way, if you're not capturing via TCP dump to get an actual work log out of MySQL, is the general log. And you can turn on the general log at this point. Uh, as of, I think, MySQL 5.0. Five, you can turn it on dynamically and turn it off so you don't have to have it running all the time because that, of course, compromises your disk speeds to be able to be writing out every single SQL query that comes through. Um, 
The Percona Toolkit also has just a pile of tools. This used to be called Motkit. It was written by Baron Schwartz, and then Baron now works with Percona. So they've gone ahead and brought that under the Percona umbrella and are supporting it as a company. And that toolkit um, has tons and tons of useful tools for managing, monitoring, and uh, taking a look at your database as things are happening. What else do I have in here? Inotop, um, when I am actually running benchmarks, I watch what's going on. I watch what's going on in the buffer pool. I watch what's going on within the database as much as I can. And I also watch with uh, system tools, trying to make sure that I understand where the data is coming from, where it's going, where I'm retrieving it from. And Inotop is a fantastic uh, tool for that. It's a lot like Top, only it's looking at your uh, InnoDB uh, InnoDB buffers and InnoDB tools and such. So another fantastic tool for managing and monitoring. That's more a real-time monitor. Nagios, of course, you can build whatever you need in order to uh, do monitoring and alerting since it's an alerting framework as well. And what else do I have on there? I guess that's my list for managing my insanity. Um, I have run through my slides. So those are my credits for uh, the, those are my credits for the pictures. Most of them came off of iStock Photo. I got it, Karen Sandler asked me this yesterday. She's like, you didn't credit anything. I'm like, but I bought my pictures. So I didn't have to. Um, in this case, I had two that came off of Flickr and one, uh, or the rest came out of iStock Photo, except for the three work card, which I pulled out. So I'm open for questions. Unless I have a pile more time, in which case I can just dance. I've got about 15 minutes. Let's do questions. Yeah. Any questions? questions? Thoughts? Suggestions also? You all want to go take a nap, right? Because it's too hot. Yes. I'm in. <laughs> I'm just yeah. wondering if there's any utility like traceroute we have for networking to measure the latency. But the same is to measure the data, like you mentioned from the browser. For example, we feed into a browser one gigabyte of data, and then we monitor how the data on the graph is being written, like the way it goes. I, I own the operating system, file mm -hmm. system cache, when the data is actually written to it. Mm -hmm. And then you will be able to see, like actually the lag between like, when the data was submitted to the browser yeah. and when the data was actually written to the, for example, disk. Down to the disk. If there's anything like that. I At least as a suggestion. Yeah, I think it would be a fantastic tool. Um, I don't know that there is one that you can do that. There are some pieces of that within InnoTop, so you can see a little bit of that. But I don't think there's something you know, that's the equivalent of like Firebug. You know, so that you can say, oh, and this, you know, this image took this long, and this image took this long, and this, you know. So I don't think there's something that's quite that specific at this point. Um, uh, Sysbench does a lot of things that are really good. The output on Sysbench, I have not figured out all of the little knobs and whistles, or, or knobs and dials and whistles and bells on the, as I mix my metaphors, uh, on Sysbench at this point. But there's a lot of stuff that comes out of Sysbench. So that would probably be where I would suggest you start, taking a peek for that. Hey, I'm actually going to speak to that last point. Oh, good. Um, we're a big NFS house, and we've got our databases on F NFS, mm -hmm. and so we've been using smoke ping to watch what, how fast, our, just check the pings and look for network freakiness, mm -hmm. but um, one of our guys went, uh, there's a null op in NFS, so he wrote a NFS ping, which will actually ping your NFS server and execute a null op, Oh. And then you can get that out and smoke ping that as an output. Nifty. And that tells you how fast your NFS server is responding, not just how fast the network stack is at. So you're right. actually drilling it a step further in. Yeah, again, the monitoring is far down as you can and what you're actually seeing as opposed to just the touch point at the NIC. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and also another caching level that may, not, may or may not be relevant is we've got both NetApps flex caches and Avers in our environment. Mm. So they sit in front of a file server and they also pretend to be a file server, but they're lying. So yeah. I don't know if that's included in your stack, but it's probably in our environment. It's, yeah, see, this is the, everybody's stack is a little bit different, which is some of the fun of this, for me mm. at least. Um, so Blue Gecko was a, a remote database administration company, or is a remote database administration company. Um, and we touch all sorts of different customers. And so that was where I was just, where I would 
realized at some point that, yeah, I can put my standard set of monitors on that, but then there are going to be a dozen more I have to write as I learn the environment. And we do the same catching the TCP dump, except we do it for render testing. Yep. So we actually watch an entire render, a shot being rendered, we'll capture the TCP dump and we play it back as, as benchmarking for our storage is how we use it. Mm -hmm. And we use the same submit a render job. And if it doesn't come out, we're like, you know it's broken because we're doing an end-to-end -end testing. So we're doing same things, different environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Other people? Stories, questions, ideas? Votes for exiting? Last slide of the day is hard. Hi, so um, uh, MySQL has like the show variables thing to dump internal state, right? Yep. Uh, a lot of those are counters, so like query counters and all that sort of thing. Yep. Um, do you know of anything that exports those, like maybe a web app that does this query every f five seconds or whatever and exports those uh, stats over JSON? Hmm. Um. So because I'm thinking it might be really useful to plug that into a time series database so you can have graphs that you don't have to watch all the time, like Inotop or something. Yeah. What we ended up doing at Blue Gecko, and I confess this counts as Blue Gecko's secret sauce, and I haven't been able to open source it, um, we wrote a monitoring tool that actually tracks those on intervals and then looks at the first derivative and second derivative and monitors and alerts on those because we want to know about changes. I don't care if it's up 10 because 10 may be exactly what I need. I want to know if it's the, the rate of change has changed or if there's any acceleration. So, yeah, so what we we did was we wrote something uh, for that for our customers. Um, there may be some tools within Percona Toolkit, and I think that there's some instrumentation within the Percona server that allows you to pull that sort of data out, but I'm not positive. I haven't generally run the Percona server myself. Hi. Um, just addressing that last question. Mm -hmm. this, stay away from the microphone. Um, this is slightly um, convoluted, but uh, there is a pl there's a plugin for Collect D, which you can do generic mm -hmm. MySQL queries, which can give you a bunch of RRDs. Right. If you've got those, um, you can then go and plug in something like Visage, which will export that as a bunch of J as JSON, mm -hmm. and then you can do your graphs and what have you using that. Is, is one possibility? Is one way to get it? But it's there's a few steps involved, but. Um, I'm certainly finding using just getting Collect D to do some of these query to do some of these queries on those counters is a good way to sort of at least get a bit of a view of what's hitting on the box. Okay. I have um, I have pulled the data in because yes, you, the 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 ability that um, you have to just do uh, MySQL uh, queries with Collect D gives you the answers to the variables because you can just query the variables. And then you see in an RRD tool, or in an RRD, you end up with a monotonically increasing graph at some point. And then you have to, as you said, do something further to massage it so you can see what it actually looks like. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it is a lot of work. Sounds like somebody needs to write a tool. Any takers? No? Oh, was this <laughs> Yes, but if you're getting, <laughs> I was going to say, but you're get, if you're getting on the DevOps bandwagon, this is you know we're we're moving the things together. Further questions? Could you talk a little bit how monitoring hmm? can distort results? Um, yes. For example, by creating overhead some other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, monitoring is one of those things you can over-monitor. And so being able to monitor the impact of your monitoring starts, we, we end up in this, this vicious circle, which is kind of awesome and kind of kind of bizarre. But yeah, you have to understand the impact of the monitor. And when we wrote the monitor that I was describing that looks at the first and second derivatives of those uh, variables in MySQL, we spent a lot of time making sure that we were not impacting the system by pulling those variables every five seconds or every 10 seconds. Another one, yay. Uh, less question, two observations. One is okay. interactive monitoring is great yep. if there's only one or two people doing it, which gets back to your over monitoring. Yep. The other thing is with a lot of our web apps, we've just ended up writing the session ID, ID pervasively mm -hmm. in the Apache logs, 
yep. in history tables in the database for the for the user activity, and that's been a really useful way of correlating what's happening end to end on the systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it allows you to be able to track. So I had this Apache idea, Apache log file, uh, log entry, and then it happened here, and then that touched there. Yeah, being able to follow the whole path of the web stack is incredibly important. Um, and I've also generally used, so I've tried to use memcached for sessions in a lot of cases, but then I've also tried to pull them back into the database so I have them statically. But if I lose them, that's okay. So, yeah. Hmm? Just curious, are you, uh, you said first and second derivatives, are you literally meaning that in a mathematical sense? I am meaning in the mathematical sense. We look at the monotonically increasing uh, graph, so it's, uh, we Excellent. see that you're just incrementing, and then we want to actually look at what the rate of change is, and then we want to look and see if that's accelerating. So I mean it very much in the mathematical sense. Okay, so <coughs> first derivative and then a derivative of that, so the rate of change of the... Yep. So the actual the speed and then the acceleration. It, yes. So the so within MySQL the variables just increment. They're just counters. So as I'm watching them, I see that uh, just a graph of that counter will just show me a straight line. But if I'm looking at um, that graph over time and having enough um, having enough. Uh, different data points, I can see if that line has a curve to it, so if it is, in fact, if the velocity is changing, or then what the acceleration is, and I can alert on those things. So do you fit a mathematical function to those data points to begin with? We do. <laughs> we do. We do it. We use a function that takes a look at, I mean, it is, it is not as strict as a true derivative, because you have, you don't have, um, uh, you don't have a full graph. You have multiple, your single, singular points. So, but you can make good approximations of the first and second derivative if you track them over time. Hmm? More questions? No. Doesn't look like it. Well, then, thank you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> On behalf of the. Um, on behalf of the organisers for LCA 2012, there's a small oh, uh, thank gift you. to thank you. And uh, if you'll uh, join your hands. Thanks, Sarah, again. Oh, thank you.